Seven Eight, calling Wright Tower for instructions. Army Five Seven Eight, come in for a closer look. Yes, the newcomer soon discovers the scope of the work that goes on here. From the varied amount of aircraft which daily wheel above Wright Field, he gets his first idea of the diversity of our many projects. All manner and description of planes are flown in for analysis, testing, and exhaustive study. Foreign ships like the Hurricane and the deadly little Spitfire. The P-39, which is making such a great name for itself on the Russian front. The P-40, Chenault's Flying Tiger. The P-38, Fort Lightning. The P-47, ready for battle above the ceiling of any plane in the air today. The A-20, the attack bomber which Axis munition centers know all too well. The B-25, from Shangri-La to Tokyo. The B-24, Rommel's Egyptian headache. The B-17, the famed flying fortress. And the B-19, the largest land bomber yet built. A promise of things to come. These planes and many more constantly are being studied, broken down in a search for defects of all kinds. Here, work on every type of apparatus pertaining to aircraft goes forward ceaselessly. These are listening devices. They are the magic ears which spot the enemy when he is miles away. This is a laboratory of aerodynamics. Its wind tunnels are geared up to subject wings to the stresses and strains of any kind of atmospheric conditions. The study of airflow is a right field specialty. Here is an interesting demonstration. When a plane is flying properly, these bits of yarn lie flat on both the wings and tail. If it goes into a stall, the air burbles and the yarn behaves like this. until the pilot once again has control. In the propeller shop, the most advanced techniques are formulated which pertain to this so important part of the ship. Master craftsmen, these mechanics go about their tasks with the care of jewelers working on delicate watches, deliberately, with patience and the utmost care. Balance is their watchword, and they seek it until the propeller is affected by the weight of a piece of ribbon. One of the field's most celebrated techniques is that of magnetic inspection. First, the metal is given a magnetizing charge. Then it is subjected to a bath of cleaning fluid. Under this continuous wet method, cracks and breakage anywhere in the object show up so clearly that they may be instantly spotted and the part discarded. The perfect units then are demagnetized and sent toward their respective jobs. Thus, with a perfect propeller, when it is necessary for a pilot to feather in order to save a disabled engine, he can do so immediately. Equally severe tests are given every inch of a plane's lifelines, the tubing. Exact gauges examine the flaring. Then enormous hydraulic pressure is driven into the tube. If the flare is faulty, it gives way. If well made, it will hold even when the tubing itself reaches its breaking point. Thus, a combat crew may go about its task knowing that the hundreds of feet of vital connectives beneath it will be down there in the heat and strain 
doing their jobs strongly and securely. Continual study is made of improvements on the hydraulic system. These lifts, which do so much to streamline a ship, control the flaps. Also, the landing gear. And the doors of the bomb bay. Brakes have an obvious importance. They are given terrific punishment in order to reveal any possible imperfections in the different units. Good pilots use their brakes only in an emergency. But when brakes are needed, they must be there to do their job efficiently. This severity of experiment is a usual procedure throughout all parts of the test center. For these researchers are as exacting and tough-minded a group as will be found anywhere in this warring world. These men are experts on the harmonization of guns and sighting devices. Already, the accuracy of American firepower is a legend from Bataan to Berlin, and these mechanics are a good part of the reason why. Checking, searching out new techniques, the ceaseless quest for absolute accuracy goes on night and day. And that's why fighter pilots of the Army Air Forces hang up the records they do. They're backed by the skill, ingenuity, and persistence of a bunch of lads that Hirohito would rather not think about. But the little yellow dastard has to think about it, or a boar sighting like this gets results like this. Good anti-aircraft crews don't just happen. They get that way through practice on tow targets. Here's our development in this field. Operation and handling of the target by a windlass, which thus permits perfect control in target practice. When the ACAC session is over, a ring is slipped onto the cable and the target thus released over an open space where it can be retrieved and used again. A careful watch is kept on the development of incendiary bombs. This stuff has been geared up to burn through metal like so much cardboard. and it's just as potent on cement. Imagine anxious Adolf when these are dropping over Berchtesgaden like so much carnival confetti. Any raid, if carried out at night, brings with it the responsibility of a safe return. Right Field has given the Air Forces equipment whereby the returning flyers can make landings without drawing the enemy to a lighted field. Lamps such as these are set up to outline the home port or an emergency field if necessary, which the pilot doesn't even know about when he takes off. By picking up a beacon, he manipulates his instruments until he's on the landing beam, and the field lights become apparent to him alone. He then slides home in perfect safety to all concerned. This chamber can be made cold enough to test all types of clothing peculiar to flying conditions. That's the new electrically heated suit being given a tryout. In this chamber, Oxygen can be so regulated as to permit a study of the reactions of men who must endure the high altitude conditions of combat flight. The sergeant, one of our vast group of anonymous researchers, has volunteered to act as a guinea pig for this experiment. With the air being removed from the chamber, 
He virtually goes up to a dangerous ceiling unprotected by the mask which sustains the other flyer. As the pressure decreases, the man with the mask helps himself to more oxygen, while the sergeant grows increasingly groggy. By such fortitude on his part, coupled with the skill of engineers and observers, knowledge is obtained to forestall that ancient dread of all flyers, blackout. If the flyer has had a bit of hard luck, which requires him to bail out, he does so knowing that his chute is as perfect as ceaseless experimentation can make it. New fabrics are tested for strength by weight drops. New shapes in the chute itself are tried out. New combinations. And the men who go over the side have come to have the implicit belief in their equipment which comes only from utter and proved dependability. That load of silk has been earmarked by those paratroopers for delivery back to Japan. There they go the high-flying dealers in destruction to those who would threaten our democratic way of life. And as they go, they take with them a knowledge that they are borne by planes that will take them to any destination, Tokyo in this case, and bring them back. They fly proved ships, use tested materiel for operations like these. Daily underscoring the belief of General Jimmy Doolittle that the men behind the pilots are as important as the pilots themselves. <laughs>